And for our next, uh, next panelists, um, they are from the Center for the Study of the Built Environment. Um, we are having both Ahmed um, uh, Al-Assad and Lara Muhammad Al-Assad. Muhammad Al-Assad and uh, Lara Zrikat. Sorry for this uh, mistake. Um, so Muhammad um, is an architect and an urbanist, and uh, he's well, also an architectural and urban historian. Uh, he, studied, he studied architecture at the University of Illinois, um, and and at uh, Urbana Campaign and History of Ar uh, Architecture at Harvard University. Uh, that's before taking uh, postdoctoral research positions at Harvard and the Institute for Advanced Study in uh, Princeton. Uh, he, uh, he also taught in multiple universities, University of Jordan, uh, German Jordan University, Princeton, MIT, and Harvard. Um, he has published in both Arabic and English on the architecture of the Islamic world in books and um, in academic and professional journalist, journals. Uh, also with him will be Lara Zrikat, um, uh, who also who is a landscape architect and the associate director of the, um, of the CSPE. And she holds a Bachelor of Architecture from University of Notre Dame and Master in Landscape Architecture um, from the University of um, California. She, uh, her work in the CSPE includes the design of native water conserving landscapes. Um, and she has work on projects um, for the Jordan National Gallery of Fine Arts uh, and led extensive public resource and publication program promoting the use of drought tolerant flora and landscape design. Um, so um, Mr. Mohammed and Lara, I give you now um, the, the room to present. So please go ahead and share your screen. Basically, um, what I will be doing is uh, present, or we at CSP first have been uh, working on a project on urban agriculture in uh, Amman and in Jordan in association with the Frederick Schiebert Foundation um, since 2018. And what I would like to do today is to present to you some of the outputs of that uh, presentation presentation is available in both Arabic and English, and it is also available online and um, in print. Uh, following my presentation, uh, my colleague Lara Zuleikat, who you also introduced, will talk about our current uh, work related to urban agriculture, which basically concentrates on public schools, where we are offering um, on the ground practical training to students relating to urban agriculture. Um, when we talk uh, about um, urban agriculture, we can really categorize urban agriculture into two groups. Um, the first group is, uh, or categories, the first one is that that is associated with the public imagination about urban agriculture, and that is uh, urban agriculture as an individual or a communal activity. It is more the conventional view of urban agriculture. Here people basically uh, plant food for their own use, uh, to exchange among friends and colleagues and acquaintances, or even to sell, but at a very limited um, scale. Now, of course, uh, this form of urban agriculture has numerous benefits, uh, whether it's on the therapeutic level or on the social level, as it creates considerable positive social bonds between the participants. The, the second category of uh, urban agriculture uh, one can think about is a newly emerging one. It basically consists of large-scale um, commercial uh, indoor activities that depend on relatively advanced technologies. Uh, basically, I would have loved to have talked about both, but time constraints would not allow us. So I will essentially concentrate on the first category of urban agriculture, that conventional one that uh, basically concentrates on individual and communal uh, activities. Uh, from our study, we've come to a number of conclusions uh, about this conventional form of urban agriculture, the individual or communal um, practice of urban agriculture. And a very important conclusion we like to make or to, to um, emphasize is that we should not look at urban agriculture as a magic solution for a number of the challenges facing cities today, uh, whether relating to income generating generation or uh, relating to food security or relating to greening the city. Uh, urban agriculture can contribute to these issues, but generally at a very limited scale. 
we have to keep in mind here, for example, that a city such as Amman has a population of over 4 million people. Um, land in it is extremely expensive and it is very scarce. And basically using available empty land um, for uh, traditional or conventional agriculture simply is not cost effective. In this context, I'd like to mention to you a study that was somewhat recently carried out by Columbia University. According to the study, if one takes every available rooftop in the city of New York and plants it with food crops, the output of this planting activity might cover the food needs of about 2% of the population of New York. So we really should not expect too much out of conventional um, urban agriculture, at least in terms of the quantity of food produced. Uh, another issue that I think we need to keep in mind is that in a city such as Amman, uh, for the last two generations, I would say, we have really lost touch or lost connection with the productive capacity of land in terms of food production. This was not the case before when Amman was a smaller city and had an abundant supply of open, unbuilt um, areas. But over the last few decades, Amman has become a rather dense city. Uh, most of the population, and Hiba mentioned that, now live in apartment buildings, and therefore we really, they really have very limited access uh, to open green areas, whether public or uh, private. So if we are to reintroduce urban agriculture to a city such as uh, Amman, we need to basically reconnect people uh, behaviorally as well as technically to the act of planting. And, and getting people to basically acquire these new skills is not easy, especially for people who are well set in their ways. And that is why we and many others uh, have come to the conclusion that uh, if we are to uh, reintroduce urban agriculture, uh, in a city such as uh, Amman, we really need to concentrate on um, students. Uh, after all, students are not set in their ways yet, and uh, intellectually, uh, psychologically, and mentally, they're still in a learning mode. And basically, um, Lara will talk uh, about our work with students uh, following my uh, presentation. Uh, not surprisingly, in a city such as Amman or in Jordan in general, we unfortunately do not have any large-scale initiatives uh, relating to urban agriculture. There is one initiative that I can mention. Uh, back in the early years of the millennium, the Greater Amman Municipality carried out a project for the beautification of Amman, and that project included an urban agriculture component. Uh, the project, however, was very short-lived and accordingly did not really have much of an impact or a long uh, Muhammad, just a small interruption. And if you can just, um, for the interpreters, if you can just slow down a little bit so the okay. interpreters can follow up. I'm trying to stay within my five minutes, that's why. No, it's okay, okay. it's okay. Take your time, but sure. uh, take your time. We have time, so it's okay. okay. Uh, just, yes, speak slowly so the interpreters and the, the people with us like uh, who can, uh, listening in Arabic, can also follow up. Uh, sure. Uh, so, uh, in spite of um, the fact that we do not have any major uh, initiatives relating to urban agriculture in a city such as Amman, uh, we actually have no shortage of um, skills relating to urban agriculture. And we found out through our study that um, there is a good number of individuals and institutions in uh, Amman and in Jordan who have been doing remarkable actually work relating to urban agriculture. Uh, for example, we have the Nur al Baraka NGO um, that, uh, and here we see a view of their composting facility that they established uh, in the uh, Princess Iman Public Garden in the Dahiyat al Hussein, and which they ran for a number of years, uh, during which CAM gave them permission to do so. Uh, we have here the um, Green Hub, which is essentially an experimental urban farm found on the roof of uh, the landmark hotel here in Amman. And we see here their aeroponic as well as their hydroponic facilities. They also have uh, aquaponic facilities there. Uh, we have the experimental green area found on the rooftop of the Amman National School uh, that is used for educational uh, purposes. Uh, in addition, we have a large number of uh, smaller projects found here and there uh, that have been implemented by a number of setups um, in Amman and in Jordan, such as Green the Camps or Mizan for Sustainable Development. 
All of these are very impressive and remarkable projects. The problem is that they are small in number and they do not have enough on a, of a wide ranging impact in a city such as Amman, which has 4 million people, or a country such as Jordan, with its over 10 million people. And also we noticed that they all face certain challenges relating to sustainability. Still, I would say there is a ray of hope. We are noticing that people are becoming more concerned about what they plant. Uh, they are more concerned about where their food comes from. People would like to see more greenery in their lives. And I would say that we are noticing that people are willing to give um, urban agriculture uh, a bit of a chance. Uh, this probably is a good place for me to hand over my presentation uh, to Lara. So as Mohammed mentioned earlier, after conducting our study, we deduced that the most effective way to re-establish urban agriculture is a widespread practice in urban centers in Jordan and to bring with it the re-establishment of the various social, economic, environmental and health benefits that Mohammed mentioned that come with the establishment of urban agriculture. As I was mentioning, the way to re-establish urban agriculture and to have an impact um, in a city such as Amman is to work with school children and especially with those in public schools. So we at CSBE, we designed a pilot project that we've been implementing over the past two years with support from FES. Uh, the pilot includes both theoretical and practical applications of urban agriculture practices. So the primary theoretical component is an activity manual that we produced that can be used by public schools to be used either uh, to supplement some of the coursework that they do or as an extracurricular activity that can support some of the topics that they already cover in biology and home economics. So our manual covers uh, an introduction to plant life, plant cycles and the needs of plants. Uh, we talk about farming seasonality and how there are different winter, summer, spring and summer crops. Uh, we introduce children to the process of planning and implementing a vegetable garden and most importantly for maintaining and caring for the vegetable garden which is the biggest challenge as Mohammed mentioned in these uh, projects and then we talk about a little bit about also harvesting of crops so in addition to the theoretical comp uh, content we provide in the activity manual we designed um, and implemented uh, the infrastructure for the practical application of the uh, topics covered in the manual. Uh, we feel that this component is critical um, and is missing in a lot of the topics uh, that are covered and addressed in public schools. So far, we've implemented uh, this installation at one public school, uh, the Al Jazair School for Girls in Jabal al Hussein. Uh, and we were planning to do two other installations in two other schools, but we were interrupted, unfortunately, due to the closing of schools uh, in the corona crisis. Um, the second topic we cover, um, which we see applied commercially a lot in some of these startups that you see in urban agriculture, such as the Landmark Hotel rooftop that um, uh, Hamad mentioned earlier, is hydroponic planting. Uh, hydroponic kits are low in cost, they're easy to implement, and they're also portable. Uh, they can be used indoors or outdoors and are very practical to use in a classroom setting. And for us, really, the cost, uh, the low cost of it was uh, very important for us if we were to apply this on a bigger scale. Most public school can purchase these without uh, external support. Uh, another important topic we cover is composting. Uh, composting, organic garden or food waste is uh, an activity that goes hand in hand with urban agriculture and it completes the natural cycle of growth and decomposition and provides the necessary nutrients for optimal plant growth. Here is, uh, and since composting is a physically demanding activity, our composting um, consultant came up with a fun installation for uh, a composting tumbler that's operated using a uh, stationary <laughs> So this uh, slide that you just saw the video is the composting tumbler that we installed at Al Jazair School. Uh, we installed it right before the lockdown and so we're hoping to continue our work when schools resume. 
another important component or aspect of the project is really pooling and disseminating uh, this local knowledge that we uh, accumulated through our study. We met a lot of people, interviewed many experts, and were surprised at how uh, so many initiatives are going on that are not really known. And there's so much local knowledge that was developed that is worth sharing and communicating. So we're incorporating this information into our activity manual and we're doing it through training of trainer sessions. We've held one training of trainer sessions uh, last year and we hope to do more of them when schools reopen. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, to really have an impact, we need to disseminate these activities. And we are collaborating currently with the Madrasati Initiative. Uh, we hope to scale up our project uh, by connecting with them through their extensive network of schools and applying uh, the manual in uh, the entire network one day eventually. Um, and we're hoping that this wider scale gener uh, uh, dissemination will generate the needed enthusiasm and knowledge uh, to bring back urban agriculture into our cities. We also hope that the hands-on care uh, and nurturing of plant life will foster environmental awareness and stewardship among our youth. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Lara and Mohammed. Um, yes, indeed, this is like a great project, especially working with, with kids and, and it looked fun, especially with the bicycle uh, mechanism. Um, I mean, I, I for myself uh, would say like during the lockdown, kind of multiple people wanted to get into some sort of hobby. Uh, and the people with gardens or just like, they started um, investing in some sort of, uh, you know, planting some kind of uh, um, vegetables or, or herbs. And it's really interesting what you said that you targeted mainly uh, kids or students. Uh, but don't you think also other groups that is important to address uh, also to work with um, I mean, yes, during the, maybe the, the lockdown, people just picked up a small hobby just for a period of time and they did drop it. Um, but maybe on also, um, let's talk into the other age group, which is like the elderly or retired citizens. Um, in, in many countries, um, when these, uh, when citizens retired, they mainly invest in to starting into these uh, planting projects on their roofs, on their gardens. Um, so do you think there's like, there's a possibility also to work there and they can also be a big contributors to urban agriculture in the city? Um, we've actually worked with a community-based organization. We've implemented one project at one community-based organization. We connected Greening the Camps, which um, I think I might have forgotten to mention that our installation was um, implemented by Greening the Camps and it was supported by InvestBank. Uh, CSR program. So we connected uh, Greening the Camps with a TV show that was run by N NBC and uh, they did, they funded the installation and the community at the community center is using uh, the facilities right now. But the main challenge is you need something structured and you need to run the program. And schools are ideal that way because they already have a structure, they already have ways in which they can kind of continue um, this. Um, if there are organizations that are willing and can sustain this kind of activity in a structured manner that it needs to be done in, then yes, I think there is potential. But uh, we're open to, you know, anyone that has any ideas uh, or is serious about this topic to approach us and we're happy to work with, with them. Okay, um, since you said that, there's one in the comment section or actually in the question section. Um, he's asking how we can, how you can work together uh, for an urban agriculture project in a school in Irbit. Uh, so you can see he has an email. So you. Yeah, well, I mean, a, a lot of the challenge too is getting funding for these types of activities. So it, it's two parts: is to get funding and to have a structured, uh, an interested, serious party that's willing to take on a uh, responsibility over a year or more than one year, you know, you can't just plant something and leave it. And then the other is getting the necessary financial support to operate it. So if all of these come together, then the project could be a success. 
And of course, we, the, the manual will be available um, online for anyone who wants to use it, and hopefully, it'll be an easy to use uh, manual. Actually. Yeah, and if someone's interested, if we're holding any workshop or training of trainer, trainer workshops, uh, there's potential for people to join in when we hold those. Okay, so uh, from our part, we're happy to disseminate all the knowledge that we have, um, and we usually make it available to the public. And I already uh, included uh, the publication in the comment section, so you can also see it and um, look into the work um, with the, the collaboration between us, FES, and the CSPE. Um, also, another question to, to you, Mohammed and Lara. Um, so, it, can, is there some kind of regulations, did you notice, that maybe is an obstacle to urban agriculture? Or maybe you think that we should work on one that shouldn't, like, should encourage it or enhance it? Or, um, from like from from your study, from the how how you implemented this project. On the um, res, you know, the, as I mentioned, there are two forms of or two categories of urban agriculture, and the uh, more conventional one, of course, there is no regulation and there is no need for regulation because you can literally plant things in your uh, balcony, uh, on your windowsill, in your garden if you have one, on your roof. And we're not talking about large amounts of money that are being exchanged. You know, one reason for regulation is also taxation. So there isn't that much money being made. The other form of urban agriculture, as I said, that one which depends on high technology, indoor and so on, then you're actually almost dealing with an industry. We still don't have any large scale projects inside cities in Jordan. We have them in other parts of the world. And I'm sure that they will make it to Amman. In fact, I found it interesting that we're noticing high tech methods are making it into farms, but not yet in the city. I think eventually they will make it into the city and then there will be a need for regulations. Uh, but we're not there yet. But I'm sure this is something we will have to address and one hopes that the authorities uh, will actually facilitate uh, these because uh, one advantage to these um, high-tech urban farms is that you can place them very close to the city. And so you have actually the, the production centers and the consumers close by. And also, um, although they're still early in their uh, development, they do save on, on land. And Jordan is a country that does not have a lot of um, agricultural land. Uh, but we, we're still not there. This is something for the future. All right. Um, thank you again, Mohammed and Lara. Uh, and now a question that uh, for our fellows at the CSPE. Um, one of the challenges facing urban agriculture in Amman is the water shortage. And what are the measures that will ensure sustainability in urban agriculture in uh, like hydroponics? Of, um, these advanced agricultural systems like hydroponics, aeroponics is actually a, a, a way to use a lot less water than conventional systems. And that's the system that's being used at the Landmark Hotel. Um, water shortages are a problem for everything, including agriculture, uh, urban agriculture. So, I mean, it has to be, uh, right now it's on a very small scale. Um, if it did um, become on a, on a larger scale, become a very large scale uh, endeavor everywhere, there would be a problem with, the, with water consumption, as is with any, sustaining any green space uh, in Jordan, but there are ways to save water. Uh, one of the ways that we, or at least use less water than conventional agriculture, like aeroponics, and this wicking system uh, that we used at the Al Jazair school, where the plant absorbs water, uh, the water it needs from a reservoir at the bottom of the bed, and it doesn't sink into the ground, so there's a lot less water um, going to waste through into the soil. You know, depending on the um, kind of crop you're using and the specific conditions, you can go down to less than 10% of water consumption by these methods in comparison to conventional uh, methods. And as Lara was saying, I mean, you don't have at least water going, uh, seeping into the soil. Every drop of water you use, you actually end up using rather than losing. Uh, to, the, to add to that, the main challenge right now is not so much water, it's actually energy consumption. True. To, 
methods because right now the energy consumption is high. A lot of them, some of them are indoors um, and require a lot of energy. Once the energy uh, issue is solved, it will become uh, more widespread, I would say, and more economically feasible to have agriculture on a commercial scale using these methods. Uh, at King's Academy, for example, uh, we didn't mention that in the presentation due to time, uh, they have a shipping container uh, where they grow their indoor uh, plant produce, mostly salad greens for their cafeteria, and they also use it as a learning tool. That's great. Um, the energy primarily goes into lighting and, uh, of course, uh, um, temperature control and we've discovered actually often it's keeping the temperature down more than keeping the temperature up in our context that is the challenge all right uh, next question is uh, why we want well, why we don't witness huge and big productive urban farming projects on the roofs of the existing buildings uh, or even on the roofs of the under construction um, either hydroponic or in other forms in collaboration between uh, Greater Amman Municipality and um, Jordan uh, JBC and the Engineering Association. Mohammed, Who's this directed for? <laughs> yes. the question. Mohammed, do you want to address that? Um, well, uh, first of all, Greater Amman Municipality, I had mentioned that it did um, try a project back in, I think it was 2008, uh, and they put considerable effort into it, but unfortunately with the change of administrations and so on, the project was not maintained. And you know, this is a general problem we face in Jordan where a project starts and starts well, but then it fizzles off uh, because maybe another administration does not support it or so on. Uh, so they did try it, but unfortunately that project came to, um, uh, and then it did not really uh, continue. Uh, what was the first question you mentioned? Sorry, um, there were two questions. Um, it's 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 part of the um, it's part of the same question that um, uh, why isn't this uh, farming projects on the roofs of existing and also under construction? Uh, roofs, as we mentioned, I also mentioned in my presentation, we should not put too much um, hope in terms of the quantity of foods produced in roofs. As I said, you know, that Columbia University study said if you plant every single rooftop in New York City, you might feed 2% of the population. Uh, also, Lara can say more about that. Uh, roofs are actually not easy to plant because you have uh, problems with wind, you have problems with heat, you have problems with the sun. So actually they are expensive. You have problems with water, um, uh, you know, having water not seep into the um, house or the building. Um, it is doable, but actually it does need a considerable amount of effort. And this is something we also came across with our study. Um, urban agriculture is not easy, actually. I mean, uh, we've also tried it personally. There's a lot of trial and error. Things don't always work. Uh, you have pesticides. Uh, some of the plants have problems. Uh, you need a lot of patience. You need commitment. Um, it's much harder to plant food products, uh, crops, than to uh, plant, uh, let's say, ornamental crops. So um, that's why actually we also are concentrating on schools because there, as Lara said, you can put it as part of the curriculum, usually in home ec or something like that. And uh, you can give it the time and the dedication and help students become more patient. Patience is extremely important. It is not a magical solution. It needs a lot of effort and a lot of, uh, patients and at least as, as I said in the presentation uh, two generations ago it was part of the culture so people actually were accustomed to it now we have to start literally from zero with this most of us really have lost that connection so I'd like there's to a long add, way to go yeah just to add something I mean uh, urban agriculture and agriculture in general is a very romantic idea and people get very excited about it mm. and you're excited by everybody you mentioned so oh it's great but it does take a lot of effort and time and energy from people to maintain it. Uh, so it's not easy to think, oh, all of Amman's roof are gonna be green if everybody takes this on. It takes time and dedication to do it. The other thing on the commercial level, uh, I don't think there's regulation now on terms of using municipal water supply mm -hmm. or agriculture uses. I mean, now uh, most of the agriculture is in agriculturally zoned areas or rain fed in areas where you're not actually using 
water supply. So that needs to be taken into account. However, uh, you will see, and we've seen, people have approached us, a surge in commercial activities uh, in agriculture, not necessarily urban per se, but in using these technologies. 